An object must fulfill two general conditions to be qualified as a military objective under IHL. That it makes an effective contribution to the military action and that its destruction offers a definite military advantage. In order to interpret the first condition, we need to get a clear idea of what is meant by effective contribution to the military action. That notion implies several requirements. Firstly, the adjective effective excludes the targeting of objects that merely have the potential to contribute to the military action. Because, for example, it could potentially be used by the enemy for military purpose. Secondly, the effective contribution must be a contribution to the military action of the attack state. There is no express requirement that the object must directly contribute to the military action. Indirect contribution is not excluded. However, with the exception of certain states, such as the US, there is an increasing support for objects which are only war-sustaining objects to be excluded from the notion of military objective. Such objects include economic installations, such as or refineries, whose revenues are used to sustain the enemy's war-fighting capability. Proponents of this view argue that the connection between such economic revenues and the military action of the enemy is too weak. Finally, the military action to which the object must contribute does not relate to any specific operation, but with the military action of the enemy in general. However, that action must be of military nature. This excludes targeting objects that only contribute to the political, financial, economic or social structure of the enemy. Let's now analyze the four different ways through which an object can make such effective contribution as is indicated in the first general condition for the definition of the military objective. Firstly, an object can make an effective contribution by its nature. This includes objects which are intrinsically for military purpose, such as weapons, military equipment, military fortifications, warships, military vehicles, like those tanks, and so on. An object can also make an effective contribution by its location. This refers to objects that offer strategic advantage to the enemy due to its location. Examples of such objects include bridges or mountain passes, which may serve as a route for the enemy. Additionally, this includes any site of military importance, like high ground, which may serve as an observing point. An object like, for example, any non-military building can also make an effective contribution by its purpose. The purpose relates to the intended use of the object. This is different from actual use. In order to target such objects, a belligerent must have clear information that it will be used for military purposes in the near future. The central question is this intention, and it must be actual intention rather than simply presumed intention. Finally, an object can make an effective contribution by its use, which relates to the present function of the object. In fact, any civilian object, even those which, as we will see, benefit from a specific protection, like a church, can become a military objective because of use by armed forces. However, in case of doubt about that military use of an object, which is normally dedicated to civilian purpose, like a house or a school, that object must be presumed as not being used to make an effective military contribution and therefore as remaining a civilian object. 
The four criteria for determining whether an object makes an effective contribution to the military action of the enemy, nature, location, purpose and use, are alternative criteria. Only one needs to be fulfilled, even if in practice an object may fulfill several of them at the same time, such as a bridge, because of its location and use. However, the fact that the civilian object makes an effective contribution to military action is in of itself not sufficient to warrant its targeting. The second condition is that the total or partial destruction, capture or neutralization of the object must offer a definite military advantage for the attacking state. The two conditions involve similar consideration, but must be established separately. It is worth observing that the term definite advantage means that the advantage must be concrete rather than merely possible. Moreover, the advantage of its destruction must be assessed in relation to the broader strategy behind the attack, not merely in its own terms. Lastly, it should be noted that only military advantage is permissible the fact that an attack would weaken the political, social or economic structures of the enemy does not render it permissible. It would be unlawful, for example, to target objects in order to weaken the negotiating position of the enemy or in order to cause economic harm. Although the two general conditions for the definition of military objective are distinct, and must be cumulatively fulfilled, it is difficult to imagine that the destruction of an object which makes an effective contribution to the military action on one side would not at the same time offer any definite military advantage for the other side. In other words, fulfillment of one condition seems to entail the fulfillment of the other. However, the second condition can act as a limit in the event that an, excess an excessively broad interpretation is taken of the first. For example, let's take the position supported by some that any objects making an effective contribution to the military action by nature include even those which are no longer used by the enemy, like a deserted military barrack or any military aircraft flying towards a neutral state to surrender. In those cases, the second condition might limit the possibility of targeting such objects, since their destruction would not normally offer any definite military advantage to the attacking state.